And our first speaker is an incredibly experienced and, uh, and inspiring speaker who I'm very looking forward to, to hearing from. And I'll just read you a short bio just to introduce him onto stage. So first up, we have got Neil Woods from Leap. Neil Woods is a former detective sergeant and undercover operative and is now chairman of Leap UK and a board member of Leap in the USA. LEAP, which stands for the Law Enforcement Action Partnership, is a UN accredited international organization composed of law enforcement figures, military and policy influencers who campaign for evidence-based drug policy. Having spent 23 years in Derbyshire Constabulary, Neil was on the front lines as a drugs undercover operative over 14, for over 14 years. He's also developed tactics and the training for other undercover officers. He later became a detective sergeant and a Derbyshire CID whilst acting as a board member of the Drugs Expert Witness and Valuation Association. Neil is a regular, a regular in, the me in the media discussing drugs and drug policy, and we are honoured to have him as our first speaker today. So over to you, Neil. Oh, look at all you beautiful people. Wow. Um, just, be just before I start uh, with what I was intended to say, I just want to ask you, it, you, you people, because I read recently that if you take psychedelics, then afterwards, and this was as a survey, uh, afterwards you get a greater appreciation of the connectivity of nature, the, the sort of planet connectivity and, and appreciation for that. It's, I'm seeing nodding heads. Give me a show of hands if that's something you recognise. Yeah? Great, that's interesting. I'll, I'll probably come back to that later on, but first of all, I need to talk about corruption and the causes of it. So when I used to work undercover, what, I, what, would, what would have to be in place before I was sort of loaned out from the East Midlands Special Operations Unit to, to the various constabularies, is that they would have to set up a particular system to accommodate my work. And what that would mean is they would have to have a, a team of nominated cops who would be able to carry out certain roles. So you would have someone who is a, a dedicated intel officer, someone who is in uh, a dedicated um, technical equipment for all of the sort of um, high tech recording and all of that kind of thing. You need a senior investigating officer um, and backup. So you have this sort of neat little team and they would be pulled from normal work, but they would be told quite strictly they wouldn't be able to talk about this with any of their colleagues. And in fact, for the period of time when they were working away to support this undercover operation, they wouldn't be able to talk to any of them. They wouldn't be able to communicate with their normal work emails or let anyone know where they were or what they were doing. And they would be reminded over and over and over again of this as the, as the project developed. And then just before the beginning of the operation, they would be sat down and they would be given a formal lawful order. And this would be explained to them verbally and by a document, which they would then sign to acknowledge that they understood this lawful order. Now, a lawful order is quite a powerful thing in the police. It means if you break it, you can get fined, you can get sacked because you've broke, you've been made, things have been made very clear to you. And that lawful order, order would be that when the undercover operative, me, arrived, they wouldn't be able to ask me my real name or where I was from or any personal things about me. So when I arrived in this team, it was quite a lonely place, really, because I had to use the same pseudonym that I was using to the people on the streets and hopefully the members of organised crime as I was to the, to the serving police around me, who was my backup team. Quite a lonely place. And I was, of course, reminded by my own handler, don't tell anybody anything personal about yourself. And it was always made quite clear from my handler that that was more to do with my police colleagues than it was the people on the streets. Now, all of that system in place, that separation from normal policing and that cocooning and even protecting me from those other cops knowing my real name, the whole existence of that system is in itself evidence of systematic corruption because they don't need those systems if we can trust everybody, do they? They don't need to have built those systems and put those systems in place to protect my life without, it's clear evidence. And I have to make it clear, of course, that the only policing where those systems are needed are when organizing drugs, organized crime. 
you don't need it for investigating anything else, not counterfeiting, burglaries, robberies, doesn't matter what it is, you don't need it because you don't have the same corruption problem. So there, was, there are other systems that come into place as a result of that stru team structure. And part of that is deciding the flow of information back and forth from the operation back into normal policing and back again. So for example, I'm out on the streets and I hear some intelligence that um, a burglary is gonna take place or an armed robbery. I feed that back into the team, but then they have to decide what to do with it. Because if that has to be fed back into the system, how do we do that? How do we do that and still protect the operation? So that, there's a sort of buffer zone of really careful consideration how the information flows. And it worked the other way as well. So if I had a briefing and the job was a series of briefings and debriefings and discussions, when I had a briefing, there had to be a decision about what I was told. So if the intel officer heard something particularly interesting, he would have to discuss it with the senior investigating officer. She would have to make a decision in a, con in a constant update, constant contempor contemporaneous log about whether I should be told. And the reasons for that are both legal and operational. Would it, could it later be suggested that me being told this information, it changed what I did during the operation? There was a lot of thought and careful consideration for this. Now for one operation which I did in Nottinghamshire, there was, there was lots of pressure on me to, to find intelligence for this particular operation, because at that point, there had been open warfare really on the streets of some parts of Nottingham. There was um, a gangster called Colin Gunn, who was, who was literally trying to take over the whole supply from everybody. And, and in that endeavor, he was at war with everybody. So, there were daily shootings. In fact, it was all over the national newspapers. And I think my favorite headline from the, from the time was Shottingham. But then I'm, I'm, quite a, I'm quite a fan of puns. Interesting to note though, in the last two years, there have been far more shootings in Sheffield than there were at that time in Nottingham. And that's not even got in the local newspapers. Just a reminder of just how much we have got used to drugs, organized crime, violence but this was a this was an age away this was in the day when it was still shocking to have daily shootings on the streets and so there was lots of pressure upon me to to find out about it now in one of those briefings i remember sitting in the morning and you could see the intel officer looking really uncomfortable with what he was about to tell me and he said we've had some uh we've had some intelligence he said it's not a1 it's not b2 as in it's not the highest quality said, but it is credible that Colin Gunn has let everybody know, and he wants it known on the streets, that if he ever catches an undercover cop, he will be snatched off the streets and tortured to death. And that's what the intel guy decided to tell me after, the, after his morning discussion with the senior investigating officer to decide if it was an appropriate thing to tell me. So, I mean, I'd love to have had a recording of that particular conversation. I mean, I'm not saying it, it didn't make me feel more relaxed. Let me put it that way. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, would, but I would rather have known than not. I really would. I mean, I was acutely aware of the dangers I was taking, but if, you know, if at least I could jump sideways if there was a Ford Transit van running up by the side of me on the pavement. So, so you know, I, it's some, one more thing to look out for. So I, I was bearing that in mind, but it was a real reminder of the risks that were involved in that, in that work. And I'd been hunting, really, someone connected to his inner circle for some time. And one of, this, one of the guys, um, it took me four and a half months to get an introduction to this man. And when I eventually did, he pulled up in a car and he'd got his son with him which was really strange because his son, I would guess, was about 12 years old. And his son was dressed up in exactly the same costume as him, the same gray tracksuit, the same trainers, and they both had shaved heads. It's like he dressed his son up as a mini me. And he'd clearly taken his son with him to teach him how to, you know, how to do gangster stuff because I, I'd been arranged to meet this guy by a phone call and I tried to get close to him for a while. And we were in a secluded street and he opened the car door and he got me closer. 
And when his son, while his son was watching, he took a knife out, pulled me closer and put a knife into my groin. Now, when you can feel a sharp blade in a really valuable place, it's quite unsettling. It makes conversation quite difficult, which I think was his intent because he was in interrogating me. He didn't trust me. And this interrogation went on, it seemed to go on forever, but it was probably only about 10 minutes. And at the end of that, he was happy with my references, the people I was talking about, the people I said I knew, all, all, all of my background, and he decided to sell drugs to me. So that was a big breakthrough. You know, it's meeting these kind of serious characters, you know, a few steps up from the street is, is, is what I was about. It's what I was trying to do. But that, at the end, of, you know, after four and a half months, it was tiring. And the next day I was exhausted. And so, but my team was exhausted as well. So two of them had gone off sick. And so the next mo that morning in the briefing, or just rather just before the briefing, I was introduced to two new police officers. I'd not met them before. And the first one, I shook his hand, had no problem with him. And the second one, I shook his hand and the hairs just went up on the back of my neck. Every instinct, every fibre of my being said, no, this guy is wrong. 10 minutes. God, I thought I had 35 minutes. I might, what, sorry? All oh, right, okay, yeah, all right. So this guy was wrong. Now, he, I didn't think much of it at the time, but I spoke to the SIO and said, look, I do not trust this guy. I do not trust him. And he said, fine, we'll exclude them both. He'll never have been in the briefing. He has not been told anything about this operation. He'll never know what you were doing, so it's fine. I was reassured. I didn't give it much thought. But then 12 months later, I found out as he'd been arrested that that, um, that person I'd taken exception to was an employee of Colin Gunn. He'd managed to get much closer to my inner circle than I had got to his. Much closer, in fact. And considering the warnings that Colin Gunn had said, they suddenly took on a whole new meaning. And this is a really important part of the costs of our current drug laws that people need to understand. So I'm always very keen to emphasize this because people don't understand it. It's actually drugs policing which is causing this corruption. It doesn't happen from anything else. And that's not just because there is more money in the drug supply, illicit drug supply, than any other form of criminality. There is, by the way, significantly more. It's not just because there's a bigger value. It's because the mechanism of policing drives and causes and drives the corruption. I'll explain. So Colin Gunn was eventually arrested. Now, the, the person who was most able to take up that opportunity that police create for these people is someone who controls the other side of the city. You create an opportunity for people's rivals. And what you do is you allow people to expand their share of the market. And if they have a bigger share of the market, they have bigger, bigger disposable income, more disposable income. And they will always use that to invest in corruption. Always. They always seek to invest in corruption because that's what makes them their business more efficient. It's what makes them safer. It makes them, stops them getting arrested. So a reminder here that policing drugs never reduces the size of the market. Not for a moment. But it does change the shape of it. And that changing shape is what we need to take notice of. But what impact does that have around the world? Well, if you look at Mexico, for example, there used to be 20 cartels in Mexico. Now there are three. Each one of those three has now got a greater gross domestic product than most West African countries. So what does that mean for West Africa? Well, in, the, in West Africa, there have been five military coups in the last 12 months, five. Now, you could say that's not unusual. Africa has a history of military coups, poverty, world inequality, causes these things. Yeah, okay. But these five military coups in the last 12 months have been about control of the biggest resource for each of those countries. And the biggest resource for each of those countries is the money controlling the illicit cocaine trade. It's the bribery. It's the corruption. And those, those, those West African states are now narco states because it's far more it's far more efficient it's far more big, better business sense to control, corrupt an entire government than it is a customs official 
It is, and that's the way it's going. The direction of travel corruption for corruption, it's only going in one direction. What does this mean? Well, this means that the health of our planet is at risk. COP26, we all disappointed? Yeah. I was disappointed. But it's, I'm sorry to bring the, to be the harbinger of doom, but it's even worse than you think. Because a lot of the countries that had to make pledges at COP26 were not actually capable of, make, of sticking to the pledges that they've made. And what I mean by that is the equatorial countries who we beg to stop deforestation, they agree to try and stop deforestation, but they can't because they don't control their own backyard. Transnational organized crime control their forests. How can a government pledge something where they don't control their own rainforests? The wrong people were at the table in COP26. Transnational organized crime needed to be there. We needed to be asking them if they care about what their grandchildren, what, what planet their grandchildren are going to inherit. Now that sounds ludicrous, but it's the much, more, much bigger chance of actually stopping the deforestation than the current system. Either that, or we regulate the supply of controlled drugs. Even the more difficult ones, as most of us will say, cocaine is, especially cocaine. Cocaine first, because the health of our planet relies on it. Brazil, Ecuador, Guinea-Bissau, Guinea, the corruption is preventing any possibility of stopping deforestation. So this is urgent, which is why I suppose I asked the question, <laughs> because I expect all you good people to care about this anyway, and I expected you to feel more connected to the world and see how everything is interconnected. But when it comes to drug policy, you know, if this is not just about individual liberty, which of course it is, it's not just about human rights, it's not just about the racism and other prejudice that this awful international policy perpetuates, which it does. Racism is in the DNA of this policy, it's the reason it exists in the first place. It's not just about the racism. It's not just about the poverty. It's not just about the drug deaths, of which we have the highest in Europe. It's also about the health of our planet, which to me, I think makes a very strong argument for this campaign of ours, because we are of one movement, this campaign of ours is the single most important political issue in the world. It might seem like a sweeping statement, but everything else is not possible. Nothing else is possible unless we tackle drug policy, nothing. Because corruption increases every single day. Of that, I guarantee the Global Initiative into Transnational Organized Crime, which is an international collective, it studies police intelligence from all around the world. Their conclusion just last September was that the growth of transnational organized crime is the single biggest threat to our security and our democratic way of life, the single biggest threat. And they said that above the climate catastrophe and beyond Putin. And of course, there's a question mark about how connected the Russian regime is to organized crime anyway. But that's the problem. There's a question mark at every level from the finance sector all the way down to the streets. Corruption is what we need to be concentrating on because we can achieve nothing else without it. Governance is essential from a government level. Governance is essential and good governance is essential for negotiating peace treaties, for trying to deal with poverty and inequality, to deal with all of the things that we care about. But our governance is being eroded. Law enforcement agencies around the world, it's no great secret, They've already made it quite clear. These are narco states. 10 years ago, they were not. That's a dramatic erosion of our international security. Dramatic. So, this is a day of action. I've seen that. I've heard Mag say it is a, it is a, it is a day of action. What can we do? Well, I'm sure that you all know people who are passionate about 
the environmental issue and the, and the need for climate action. I'm sure some of you may well be already involved yourselves, but if you know other people, you need to please be explaining this to them. We need to become one movement. This is one struggle. We can't be doing this in silos anymore. We've got to be forming alliances with everybody else who cares about our overlapping issues. We have to become one movement. And if you think of some innovative way of doing that, God, please come speak to me. And my good friend, Clemmy over there from Health Poverty Action, I'm working very carefully closely with Clemmy, trying to work out how we can get this message out there much, much more effectively. What can we do about it? What can we do about it? I'm asking you and I'm asking for help. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Neil. So we've got a few minutes now for Q&A. We've had some questions through from uh, our lovely audience who are watching on Zoom. Am I best to be on the stage, Ash? My best be on the stage. I just realised there is a camera that I should I should probably uh, be on the stage for. Um, so perhaps we'll start with some questions from the audience first. I can see this lovely gentleman over here has got his hand up. If you wouldn't mind shouting it quite loudly and slowly, then I'll repeat it for our lovely Zoom audience. So the question is, has Neil got any personal experience of psychedelic drugs? And what would a controlled cocaine policy look like in the UK? And Neil, you don't feel like you, don't, you have to answer either of those questions if you don't want to. <laughs> I, know, I mean, I, uh, whether it's on um, Radio 5 or Radio 4 or whatever I've had been asked that question, I always say the same thing, that I, I refuse to pub publicly state what drugs I have or haven't used if to be in solidarity of all those people who are persecuted for not having that choice. And the, and the second one, well, there are people way, way cleverer than I am who have worked out very good, very good models of how we could regulate um, cocaine. And I would direct anybody to the work of Transform Drug Policy Foundation for you know, the, the, the document um, blueprint. But also, I would, I would also like to add that um, you know, some regulation of cocaine has already happened in Bolivia. And Bolivia stepped away from the single convention in order to insist that they could regulate coca leaf for their population. And they won that argument. They won. And uh, I remember being at the UN CND in Vienna, the, the, the yearly meeting for, for drug policy uh, issues at the UN. And Bolivia had uh, <laughs> had this event. And then at the end of it, they had hosted, a, you know, you can sort of have a tea and biscuits thing that the, one of the speaking agencies can organise there. And at their tea and biscuits thing afterwards, they had several plates full of coca leaves, which I just thought was wonderfully cheeky. But also, but also, it, I found it quite inspiring that, you know, you really can stick two fingers up at the conventions and do something. And there is, if, there is a possibility of political choices and momentum to, to break this into these international, international treaties. Thank you. Okay, the lady in the stripey top top. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm no expert in climate activism or the climate crisis, I'm very far from it, but I do know that there is strength in numbers and I do know that we can achieve more as a bigger movement. But what I, but what I would observe is, you know, having spent a lot of time talking about drugs and drug laws and drug policy, is that actually, you know, because I, I speak to, as, as often as I can, to an undecided small-c conservative audience and you know, we, we at LEAP, we never fail to win that audience over. We never fail to, whether it's Women's Institute, Rotary Club, whatever it is, we never fail. We only need the platforms. We only need the platforms. And one thing that I've observed, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to say that there's a sinister alliance between capitalism and the, uh, the shady capitalism of the illicit drug markets. And in some ways, you know, there's obvious connectivity in some places. But what I see more is naivety and... Yeah, it's simply not knowing. And that's the case with politicians. I meet a lot of politicians and you can see actually in the politician's eyes, the light dawning, suddenly, suddenly they get it. It's naivety, it's a lack of understanding. We just need the platforms. We've got the evidence, we've got the talent, we just need the audience. So the more platforms we can have, the better. So if anyone knows anyone who can arrange a platform, especially if it's with some undecided people, that's how we win this. We win by growing the growing the movement as fast as we can. Rebecca, you had a question. So, um, I'm a and we're seeing cannabis in the rest of the world, really all the old, um, regulations being rolled back, a real awareness of the environmental benefits of um, hemp um, as, a, as a clean-up tool and as a public transportation tool. 
And putting it under psychedelics kind of, what I feel, muddies the water sometimes in the importance of cannabis as a plant um, for health and well-being and as a food. Um, and with the psychedelics being class A's and also, you know, the shady dealings around the cocaine industry, it, do you feel that if we separated the two out and looked at cannabis more as an agricultural plant and as an environmental plant, less as a as a drug and much more as an agricultural important um, climate change tool, we might be able to then shift some perspectives around cannabis. And then once you start there, like, as I say, it's a gateway drug, you could then start looking at psychedelics in a new way. Yeah, I mean, th there's various ways of doing that. And there's various ways of strategizing. What I worry about is if in shaping any kind of anything shaping the argument in any way that could be exceptionalist so that you know cannabis is special it's, it's a plant it's not a drug i see great risk in that because then that separates it from things that they're, well, they're drugs aren't they and we we want the public to accept the use and personal choice of all drugs including cocaine all drugs so in terms of the long-term argument i accept what you're saying um, and I, it's highly important that cannabis is, in fact, a gateway drug, because as soon as we have legal regulation of cannabis in most countries, it's going to make all the other arguments far easier. But we have to be honest. People like getting high, and there's nothing wrong with that, I think. <laughs> yeah, medicine. Yeah. He's a medicine as well, yeah. So I'm going to say, this gentleman over here, can you keep your questions short? Is that okay? Do you mind just coming around? Yeah. Okay. Hello. Um, thank you for that. And I'm going to, I'm hoping I can ask this question twice. In other words, I want to ask it later, but I want to get your opinion as well, because it seems to me that the Human Rights Act and the European Convention on Human Rights is, is, a, is an open door for getting a, uh, a ruling of declaration of incompatibility by the Supreme Court. In other words, telling the government, you've got to change all your laws because they can violate our fundamental freedoms guaranteed by the Human Rights Act. Any thoughts? <laughs> yeah, I was, I was instructed on the Human Rights Act as part of my operational briefings, uh, particularly Article 8, the right to privacy and family life. And then I proceeded to trample all over it with impunity. Um, because I'd been told about it, that meant I could break it, <laughs> essentially, um, because I just had to bear it in mind. Uh, but, you know, the fact that I was operationally chasing organised crime meant that I was never going to be liable for actually doing that. So, you know, that they're, they're a good thing to consider that we should aim for, but, uh, but the aggression and ruthlessness within our drug laws and dr the, the way we apply our drug laws is way beyond that. Thank you. We've got a couple of questions from our Zoom audience. Um, so, yeah, I think it, uh, one of our... Um, uh, viewers just wanted a little bit more clarity around the uh, the law. Should the laws around cocaine be tightened or relaxed? I think you kind of answered that, but regulation. What does that shape of regulation kind of you know really look like at the moment? We can only take this enormous power away from organised crime, both domestically and internationally, if we take their power away from them, and that is by taking control of the commodity. We have to regulate. This has to be controlled by governments and not gangsters. Now, what that regulation looks like has to be taken into consideration for uh, social equity and um, the impact of the communities that's been devastated by the war on drugs they need to be invested in. But, but essentially, we've got to take the control away from criminals because it's that control that means they're corrupting entire governments. Okay, we've got some time for one more question in the audience. Okay, this is over here. Do you want to say it? And I'll, I'll repeat it on the mic if you want to come up. Um, so, more about uh, the incentive layers there. How will we incentivize above what the uh, what, what organized crime syndicates can offer for people who are subjected to corruption? Um, what I mean by that is there are obviously huge payouts, right? It's not, it's not threats to family or kidnappings or anything that you see in Hollywood. It's just a big lot of cash, and that's how corruption is coming through. How do we override that incentive structure? So, how can we override the incentive structure of like organizers in West Africa? 
Yeah, okay, but just before I do that, I'll just clarify a point actually, which I should have clarified earlier on, and I'm sorry about this. When, when I, I, I argued with some, with some police in Denmark, and again in Norway, about the, the power of corrupt, the impact of corruption, and they just sneered at me. They said, yeah, well, we're not as corrupt as you are in the UK. And they, they were looking down on the UK, and I don't want to give the impression that I'm looking down on the global south because they're suffering the impact of the corruption, which is essentially caused by wealthy people in the in the in the rich in the rich nations. Uh, so I just want to clarify that corruption affects the entire world. Um, but how do we how do we beat it? Well, I mean, the money packages, the incentives go hand in hand with the brutality as well. There's a there's, if you you can see there's an interview on online. You'll find it on YouTube with the head of the navy for Guinea-Bissau, who has been accused of being a drug dealer. And actually facilitating the, tra the transport of cocaine across the Atlantic. He says, no, of course I'm not a drug dealer. Of course I'm not. This is before he got com com convicted of being a drug dealer. But the, the point is, he had no choice at all. He's the head of the Navy. And if he didn't do that drug dealing, then he would have been killed and someone else would be put in place. And they would be paid. So it's the carrot and the stick in the most brutal way possible. And... It's, it's complete, you know, the corruption is complete and there's, there's nothing they can do about that. And the only way that we can try and rescue those, those people, people like him in from that situation, is to regulate the market. And if you regulate the market, you know, this is, even the UN estimates this is half a trillion uh, dollars value in the world. And I, I always think that the estimates of the drug trade are way, way below what, what they actually are. And, you know, we could take control of that. We could take control of that and we could do good with that and we could protect our planet with that and we can stop all of that violence and we could stop the head of the Guinea-Bissau Navy being forced to be a drug trafficker. We can stop all of that. And I, I make it sound simple because, you know, policy, policy people or the opposition will suddenly balk at that and say, no, no, it's much more complicated than that. And that's often the best response prohibitionists can come up with to, to what we say is, oh, no, no, it's much more complicated than that. Right, then how is it more complicated than that? Enormous amount of money in the power of the worst elements of our societies worldwide, corrupting and threatening the most vulnerable. Have I missed anything? <laughs> Thank you very much, Neil Woods.